to another edition of RCE. I'm your host, Brock Palin, and again, I have Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and the Open MPI Project. Jeff, ha- hope you had a good holiday weekend. Hey, Brock, yep, sure did, and uh, certainly can tell that your microphone is on the fritz. We're going to have to apologize to our listeners in advance today that you, you're using your laptop mic instead of your regular one. Yes, I am having strange USB issues where I cannot get my good microphone to work, so I'm on my backup um, we have today Peter Honeyman and Bruce Fields, both from the University of Michigan's Center for Information Technology Integration, better known as CITI. Um, I should point out, Michigan is my alma mater, so I've actually kind of been familiar with CITI for a while. So, Peter, Bruce, welcome to the show. Yeah, hi. Thanks a lot. Okay. How about you guys introduce yourself and say your name so people can connect and um, give a little background. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm Peter Honeyman. Uh, uh, I'm a uh, research professor of computer science at the University of Michigan, and I've been here for a long, long time, uh, measured in decades. Uh, all of the time I've spent at, at Michigan, I've been at City uh, as more or less the staff scientist, uh, uh, and um, at this point, uh, I kind of run the place. So. That's my gig. And I'm Bruce Fields. I'm an assistant research scientist at City. Uh, I came to Michigan to study mathematics, uh, but after getting a, getting a doctorate in 2000, I uh, came to City. And uh, since then, I've been working on uh, Linux and uh, NFS, and I maintain the uh, Linux kernel's NFS server. Okay, so we're here to talk about the NFS v4 effort specifically, but for anybody who might not know, can you give us a quick description of what NFS is and then get on to what NFS v4 brings versus v3? Yeah, sure. Um, So NFS stands for Network File System. Most people are familiar with NFS. Uh, It has been a standard component of uh, all Unix and Unix-like operating systems uh, since the early 80s. Uh, It was developed by Sun Microsystems. Uh, Well, it was kind of developed by Bill Joy when he was uh, was still uh, a grad student at Berkeley, but it was uh, really matured at at Sun uh, and um, became... um, Universal uh, among Unix, uh, Unix-based operating systems because uh, it was uh, a, an open system uh, in the sense that uh, Sun published the protocol for NFS and allowed uh, all of the other vendors to, to do their own implementations. So NFS really was one of the, the very first uh, open systems uh, uh, around. In fact, uh, Sun went beyond just publishing the uh, uh, the specs for the protocol, but they made uh, open source implementations available. Well, they were nearly open source. They were quite freely available uh, to universities. NFS is a protocol um, more than more than anything else. I mean, people think of it as a file system, but really it's, it's a protocol, a client-server-based protocol uh, that allows uh, uh, servers to distribute files to, to, to multiple clients uh, within you know, a, a, a strict Unix-like uh, namespace. It um, uh, supports the uh, POSIX uh, interface and uh, uh, looks in, in, in every way to a client like uh, a, you know, a regular local file system. Oh, except when the network screws up. Anyway, um, NFS was designed in a time when uh, you know local networks prevailed, uh, when networks had lower bandwidth than than it's available today, uh, and uh, latency rarely became uh, much of an issue because uh, everything was was done on the local level. Uh, it was also designed in an, in an environment. It was really designed before the you know the explosion of the internet, which I guess dates to like 1990 or the early 90s. Uh, so security was was uh, uh, less of an issue for 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 NFS. It started out uh, as version two. Uh, no one really knows that what happened to version one. I mean, maybe it's like you know Oracle. <laughs> they wanted to sound mature, so they started at version two. Uh, there was a 
some, some, some small changes were made to it uh, along the way in the 90s uh, to improve its uh, ability to, to, to cache files and to improve performance. But uh, NFS seemed to be stuck at version 3 for a long, long time. And there were some, some, uh, some problems with version 3 uh, that made it, made it difficult to extend it, to scale it out to uh, uh, an Internet scale with uh, the scale of uh, the number of users on the Internet as well as the, uh, uh, the, the latencies uh, that, that are, are common on the Internet. Uh, it was mostly uh, implemented as a UDP-based protocol, and that's just not going to cut it uh, uh, on Internet scale. But because it was a protocol that belonged to Sun Microsystems, uh, it, it was difficult to, to push it forward. Um, Sun had the incentive, but uh, couldn't really develop the consensus. Uh, other folks that were involved in NFS development had the consensus, but uh, they didn't really have the in, uh, incentive to improve what uh, was you know, essentially something that was owned lock, stock, and bail by their competitor. So Sun actually, in a very mature way, found a way out of this problem by uh, dedicating the protocol to the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is where Internet protocols are born. Uh, and the IETF uh, formed a working group to develop the next version of NFS. That, that's where NFS v4 uh, came from. By about 1999 or 2000, uh, the, uh, it was pretty well understood what NFS v4 would look like and how it would be different from, uh, uh, from, from earlier versions. And that's kind of when Citi got involved, when some of the, some of the vendors, uh, Sun Microsystems, Network Appliance, were looking to promote this, uh, uh, the new uh, standard or the, you know, the incipient standard. Um, by uh, commissioning City to build the, uh, uh, the Linux-based open source reference implementation of NFS v4. Uh, in that way, there could be multiple independent uh, implementations from, from a common specification, which, if shown to uh, interoperate, would satisfy the IETF's uh, requirements for, uh, for, for new standards. So that's kind of the early history of uh, v3 and v4. Okay, so what are some of the advantages of V4 over V3? Um, sounds like V3 actually, while it had some performance improvements over V2, really didn't have anything to address the scale. Like, our focus here on RCE tends to be high-performance computing, people running large compute clusters or clouds or similar kinds of applications, maybe with thousands of clients. NFS has never really been something that's been described to go on thousands of clients. Is this something being addressed with V4? Yeah, uh, that's some of the some of the uh, later work that that we're doing. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, V4 and and um, how it is dif different from V3. Um, first of all, uh, some of the problems of V3 were addressed uh, with you know essentially with a hammer. Um, Security in in uh, in NFS v4 is mandatory, uh, and it, v4 is required to support uh, uh, Kerberos-based uh, security mechanism, uh, as well as a public key-based security mechanism. Uh, this requires some changes uh, to the remote procedure call uh, mechanism that's used by NFS. Uh, there's a uh, an internet standard called GSS, Generic Security Services. Uh, and by melding um, the RPC and GSS, you get this RPC SEC GSS, which is the, uh, uh, the remote procedure call package with the GSS security mechanism uh, laid in as, as one of the you know as one of the security uh, mechanisms for the RPC. Now, I, I kind of think that actually that could be done with V3. I mean, that could have been done with V3, don't you think, Bruce? Uh, it has been. I mean, uh, yeah, V3 supports uh, all V3 implementations. Modern ones at this point support RPC set GSS as well. But it was uh, partly the V4 uh, uh, implementation effort that actually made that happen. Yeah. So, uh, so, it, so, so it, it gave it gave the right push uh, uh, at that point. I mean, NFS security prior to. Uh, 
uh, RPC Sex GSS was pretty much you just kind of throw your user ID on the wire, you know, oh, I'm 101, and uh, the server b believes you. So uh, it was, a, you know, a trivial exercise for uh, undergraduates uh, throughout the, uh, the late 80s and throughout the 90s to build little shells that could, you know, wander around through NFS space and pretty much, you know, lie about their identity and, and uh, access uh, um, uh, file, file servers uh, anywhere. Okay, so that was kind of a, you know, security was, was really kind of a joke. Uh, that's now fixed. Uh, the, that mechanism, that kind of security mechanism is optional now in, in NFS v4, but it's required that it support the stronger security mechanisms. That's one uh, uh, major change. A second major change is uh, uh, UDP is pretty much prohibited in, uh, uh, in NFS v4. I mean, the language of the spec doesn't come out and say it. What it says is that uh, the transport layer uh, is required to support, uh, you know, some, uh, uh, some, some, some features that uh, more or less say, yeah, it's got to run on TCP. So uh, compliant NFS v4 implementation is, uh, must run on TCP. And that uh, solves a lot of the, uh, the long haul uh, problems, the wide area problems that, that uh, uh, NFS v3 had, which, you know, based on UDP, uh, it had all the retransmission uh, issues that, that arise with, with, with UDP uh, and the, you know, fragmentation and, and, you know, all the other ugliness uh, more or less the reason why we abandoned uh, UDP for, for most uh, purposes. Uh, let me think, uh, what else does V4 have? Well, another of the Actually, historical... So... Oh, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I, as a networking guy, I just, uh, I'm a little curious. What kind of features are required uh, that require TCP besides, you know, uh, built-in retransmits and things like that for long haul? What uh, oh, you my, mean my the... obvious questions, you know, jump to like, all right, well, UDP was great for scalability, um, but you, you lose at least a little bit of that with TCP because it consumes a bit more resources and things like that. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't think that UDP was great for scalability unless, you, unless what you mean is uh, it didn't require any cycles, uh, which I don't think of as being a scalability issue. Uh, the, I, you know, I can't quote to you the actual language of uh, RFC 3530, but what is it? It, it requires flow word, control and, uh, and the word reliable is in there. So, yeah. As so, you say, recent. Yeah. So, uh, gotcha. uh, yeah, reliable flow controlled. Uh, I don't think it requires sequencing, <laughs> but, uh, you know, if you want, if you need reliable flow controlled, you, and you want to do that with UDP, then you pretty much have to build up the entire TCP infrastructure around UDP, which is more or less what was done in V3. Uh, you know, um, with uh, the in the in the RPC level, uh, but uh, that's a messy place to do it, and it it it, uh, uh, it leaves you with an implementation that kind of doesn't advance with TCP. You know, and TCP advances everything that runs on TCP gets the advantage of it. Uh, anyway, um, yeah. So that that's that's answering your question about UDP. Uh, and I think Bruce was going to say a little bit more about some of the advantages of V4, some of the differences. Well, a historical annoyance with uh, V3 has to do with the way it developed, which was uh, when, when a new feature need, was needed, it was often added by adding another protocol on the side to implement that feature. So, for example, when uh, people wanted uh, uh, file locking, uh, what, what they did was to create another, a separate file locking protocol. Um, uh, so there's a separate protocol for file locking. There's also a separate protocol for ACLs. Uh, there's another one that's used uh, by the initial mount program to get the uh, root file handle. And uh, this becomes somewhat of a nightmare, again, for the, especially for the long haul, uh, if you need to traverse any uh, firewalls. So one change in v4 is that all of the functionality is put into one single protocol. It was also a, a real problem because... Uh, uh, while, while vendors paid very close attention to NFS interoperability, uh, LOCKD interoperability was less, uh, you know, less assured. Uh, so that um, it, it became the case that if you, if you thought you might be working in a, in a multi-vendor environment, then you couldn't rely on the existence of a locking protocol 
you know, that, 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 that worked across uh, all vendors. Oh, fun so, stuff. Yeah, so locking is now built in. So that tells you uh, something real important um, right there about V4 as opposed to V3. V3 is, is known as a stateless protocol in the sense that the server doesn't maintain state on behalf of the client. Every request has all of the information in it that's, that's needed to service the request. V4 is extremely stateful. The server keeps a lot of uh, state on behalf of each client. Uh, and, and uh, you know, that, I mean, that's a mixed bag there uh, that, that affects uh, the, the reboot and recovery mechanisms uh, for for v4 but it also uh, you know it frees the, the the client server protocol from from uh, you know having to have on the one hand this kind of arid environment in which you can't really do much you can't have locks uh, you, you you can't uh, uh, negotiate uh, uh, special features of the connection uh, for for a specific client uh, uh, at the same time uh, the open call in in um, uh, in, in NFS v4. I mean, NFS v3 didn't even have an open call. Uh, v4 has this open call that uh, is really pretty expensive to run uh, and, and requires a lot of negotiation between the client and server to to pick out all of the the, the options that that they want to uh, you know to control that uh, their their connection. Uh, but uh, AFS proved long ago that having a stateful uh, server can have real performance benefits uh, in, in terms of scalability. Now, when, when I talk about scalability, I'm talking about, you know, how many clients can a server, uh, can, can hook up to a server without washing that server out, or uh, can we scale to long haul or to, you know, to, to, to high speed or low speed, scale up, scale down. Um, uh, having uh, both uh, you know, a, 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 uh, a reliable and robust transport and a stateful server uh, allows, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a funny thing because what, what AFS proved is that uh, with, with, a, with, with the server maintaining state on behalf of the client, the clients could be expected to do a lot more of the work. And that's why AFS has better scaling properties than, than NFS v3. You, you know, back in the day when AFS was, was uh, being developed, uh, you could you could go up to maybe a couple of dozen clients per server with NFS, and AFS was shooting for a thousand clients per server. They did that with the you know the the, the, the strong caching uh, uh, on uh, on the clients, but you can't do co- client caching. Uh, you can't do you know consistent client caching without the server getting involved and you know keeping track of well what you know what's in each client cache. Now, NFS still doesn't really have. Um, that kind of uh, you know robust and reliable uh, mechanism for client caching, but one thing that V4 does have is a mechanism called delegation, which uh, kind of came out of the Windows world. Um, what it what it comes down to is if if a client uh, is the only client with an interest in a file, then the server can delegate all of the operations on that file to that client. Mostly, what we're talking about is, is stateful operations like locking. Um, so if I'm a client and, uh, you know, I, I start accessing a file uh, and the server delegates the file to me, grants me a delegation on the file, then I can run locks and, and stuff like that on the file and it becomes local operations. I use my local lock manager and I don't have to talk to the, to the server's lock manager at all. Now, obviously, if two clients want to use the same file, if there is, in fact, uh, concurrent sharing, uh, then the delegations have to be revoked, which is very similar to an AFS callback operation. Uh, and then uh, subsequent locking takes place on the server with the server's lock manager, and things get a little bit slower, uh, as they have to uh, when, you, you know, when you have to uh, negotiate and moderate uh, uh, this kind of uh, concurrent sharing. So that's another feature that, that, uh, uh, that's in there. It also has, uh, uh, as Bruce mentioned, ACLs built in, and uh, the ACLs, these are access control lists. Um, You know, V3 was very much of a uh, Unix-like file system, so the access model was more or less mode bits. Uh, V4 
has, uh, you know, these access control lists that, that really kind of came out of the Windows world again because uh, people anticipated that V4 uh, could extend to uh, Windows clients. Uh, and the, the easiest way to do that was to kind of pick the union of features uh, among uh, Unix and, and Windows clients. So, so the ACL model uh, is is something that's uh, uh, more familiar maybe to to uh, Windows folks. I mean, in the sense that it is not the POSIX, uh, it's not POSIX ACLs. Well, I mean, it's my personal opinion that POSIX ACLs are totally broken because they try so hard to emulate Unix mode bits. It's my personal opinion that Unix mode bits are totally broken. Uh, so um, it does, you know, it, so it has, it has uh, uh, these ACLs built in. It also has uh, other Windows-y kinds of things like uh, in a Windows file system, uh, when, you, when, a, when an application open, opens a file, it can open, open it and uh, deny uh, access uh, to other opens at the, at the instant of open. It's kind of this atomic, you know, open-deny operation. Um, and uh, V4 has a, has a mechanism for, for that as well, which is really difficult to support uh, on Unix systems, uh, but uh, makes it possible to have multi-protocol servers uh, that, that can serve up both you know, SMB and, uh, uh, and NFS to Windows clients uh, because it has the same you know, it has a, a common semantics for, for sharing. So. See, is there other stuff? Yeah, there's other little things like it has a compound RPC. Uh, the the, the remote procedure call mechanism in V3 is uh, kind of a command at a time. You issue a command, you get a response, uh, and it's very you know very synchronous like that. Uh, in V4, the the RPC there's really only is there's really only uh, two RPCs: the null RPC and then the compound. And the compound contains a bunch of other uh, remote procedure calls. So you can, you know, load up in a single RPC uh, a, an open and uh, a read of the first 4K in a single request. Uh, and I'm not really sure if the, if the designers of the protocol thought that they would get uh, a performance benefit out of it. It turns out that you kind of don't. Um, and I'm, I, I think what it, I mean, my opinion is it cleans up the protocol a lot. Uh, in in V three, some of the res some of the responses that you got back from the server would include extraneous information like stat information about a file that you that you modified, uh, which you know strictly speaking is not really part of the expected response uh, to an RPC, uh, but it was something that you would you know the the designers of, of the V three RPC the V two RPC they knew you know quote knew that you would always want to have this information anyway. In V4, you can now sort of isolate the, uh, uh, a request and response. And then uh, if, if you think that a request, like a, like a write request, is going to require uh, the return, uh, a return of attributes, uh, then you just throw the, uh, the get attribute request uh, into the compound RPC along with the write, and you know it cleans up the semantics, makes it easier to uh, to reason about uh, about what the protocol is doing. All right, so you threw a, a whole bunch of features at us here. I wonder if I could go back and, and touch on at least one of them here. Uh, you mentioned, um, or, or Bruce mentioned earlier, actually, that uh, in, in V3, every time you wanted to do something new, you, you, you made a new protocol for it. In V4, you've kind of slurped all these protocols together into one. So there's one protocol, and, and one of the benefits you mentioned was you know vendor interoperability because it's all one thing now. Is the new protocol itself extensible so that you can you know do the unanticipated things in the future without doing you know the the v3 sin of creating yet another protocol on top or or are you going to have to go that route yeah it's extensible in uh, new ways for two reasons one is as peter mentioned it has this uh, compound operation uh, so the operations that you send to the uh, um, to the server are built up out of lots of little operations and uh it also added a uh, minor versioning uh, capability. So you can, while staying, still staying within NFS before, you can add additional capabilities. That, and the most common way to do that is by adding additional operations that can be strung together into these compounds. 
And uh, the latest effort there has been uh, NFS v4.1, uh, which has an RFC that's just coming out now, um, which adds a bunch of new operations that support new features. Yeah, this extensibility mechanism is actually really important. Uh, uh, when we were talking before, you know, before we went on the air, uh, there was a, a question, you know, what would what will, what what can we expect in NFS v5? Uh, and the answer is there there should be no NFS v5. We are now um, uh, testing interoperability uh, and completing our implementations of v4.1 now that the uh, IETF has endorsed uh, the, the, uh, the specification for it. And within the IETF, we're talking about what will we want in NFS v4.2. So this minor uh, minor versioning extension uh, gives us uh, a way to, to to move forward without having these you know sort of cataclysmic uh, change uh, uh, at every at every uh, you know, every time someone has a new idea. And I bet you're wondering what's in V four point one. So we've been talking a lot about security and a lot of cleanups and fixes from V three. What specifically do you expect v4 to be able to handle a very large number of clients per server? Like you mentioned, AFS could do a lot better than NFS v3 could. Um, what kinds of things have been done for like in the high performance computing space where we may have 10,000 clients actively using the server at one time that exists in v4 that will enable that versus v3? Yeah, a lot of the um, motivation for the development of V4 has come out of the uh, high-performance computing community, uh, especially the, the national labs. And, uh, of course, uh, what, what, what we learned, having uh, designed uh, and implemented V4, was that it wasn't enough. Uh, there are things that are done uh, in, in large clusters that uh, uh, are, are so unusual and irregular that special special mechanisms ha had to be invented for them. Things like you know um, ten thousand uh, ten thousand nodes opening the same file at the same time, or uh, ten thousand nodes creating a file in the same you know creating ten thousand different files but in the same directory. Uh, those kind of metadata operations uh, were. Found to be, you know, really slow, and, and in fact, um, uh, affecting uh, the performance of, of large computations. Even though those uh, kinds of operations are, are, are relatively rare, uh, I mean, they are. But but uh, those guys run on on pretty pretty bizarre machines, like the Roadrunner guys that have a, you know, a mean time to failure of, of you know, less than twenty four hours. So they have to checkpoint for it uh, fairly frequently, and. A checkpoint operation uh, involves this kind of, you know, massive metadata, uh, massive scale uh, metadata kinds of operations. Uh, we're actually still working on that, uh, on those kinds of problems. And the, the, the real problems that we're finding there are, are with the, the POSIX API. Um, and we may, we, you know, we may uh, figure out uh, how, to, how to solve those kinds of problems. But uh, one of the things that we have figured out how to solve is uh, something that has been Endemic to the to uh, NFS and indeed to any uh, you know, conventional client server protocol uh, from the start of time, that is to say, since the 80s, uh, and that is the single server bottleneck. Uh, to the extent that uh, a whole bunch of clients want to get access to a single file, uh, that file lives in a, in a namespace. Uh, the namespace dictates what server. Uh, that the clients all have to go to, and so everyone's got to, you know, kind of get lined up behind the same server. There are ways to have uh, cluster file systems that that uh, spread a namespace across uh, a bunch of servers, and uh, there are products out there that that that, that do this fairly well. Uh, IBM's got GPFS, uh, PolyServe, which is now a part of uh, uh, Hewlett Packard, uh, had a, a pretty cool cluster file system. Um, what, what those things have in common uh, is uh, behind the scenes they have a distributed lock manager of some sort that is uh, uh, negotiating you know the access from the various cluster nodes when, when, when sharing takes place 
But uh, presumably those guys are getting it right. They're doing a good job of it and, and building high performance systems. Then the question is, well, how can we, you know, how can we extend this into the in, into the NFS space so that uh, you know s- servers can take a, advantage of the fact that that uh, uh, there are multiple uh, uh, cluster nodes uh, serving up uh, the same namespace so that we can distribute the load uh, across them. Uh, this was actually pretty easy to do in NFS v3 uh, because it was stateless. So the all of the action took place in the background in the distributed lock manager. But now that NFS v4 is a stateful protocol, uh, some uh, uh, some negotiation or some some uh, arrangement has to be made for the uh, uh, for the, the cluster node heads uh, that are acting as servers to you know to kind of uh, keep things straight. The obvious way to do that is to push uh, the the uh, uh, consensus management and the concurrency control uh, back into the, uh, the into the back end into the into the lock manager of the cluster file system. So we found ways uh, in in uh, uh, in our implementation of the protocol to support that. And so now now we support cluster file systems fairly well. Uh, there's another issue that arises, uh, and that is uh, uh, a client uh, trying to get uh, access uh, to uh, uh, to files that um, uh, you know exceed the, um, the the server's bandwidth uh, uh, ability. So normally, what you do here is is you stripe a file across uh, multiple servers, and um, you know get access to it that way. Now you can do this manually. Uh, and in fact, most operating systems have a, have, have a way of doing that, but um, that becomes, you know, kind of a, uh, an implementation that is specific to uh, a, uh, uh, a high-performance file system, a proprietary high-performance file system that will have its specific mechanisms for, for arranging for striping or, or for, you know, uh, uh, object storage access or, or, or SAN access or whatever. And then the vendor is, is stuck with this problem of supporting, you know, oh, I need now I need to get the striping mechanism running on Linux and on NetBSD and on Windows, and, you know, all over the place. Uh, the HPC guys at the, at the labs, uh, uh, the folks at the labs, uh, saw an opportunity to build support, to extend the NFS protocol to build support in uh, for uh, this kind of uh, uh Access this ex- extended kind of access uh, striping and, and and similar things uh, into the protocol. So that's one of the things that uh, NFS v four point one has in it. Something called PNFS or parallel NFS, which uh, uh, I don't know. I'm talking too much. I'm going to let Bruce describe PNFS. The idea is very simple. It just gives uh, the server a way to alter to advertise alternate channels to a file's data. So at the time that a client opens a file, it can ask the server, okay, where is the data for this file actually located? The server hands something back to the client called a layout, uh, which tells the client where to go, and the client goes there. Um, And there are different alternatives for what there could be. Um, The client could talk directly to a disk if it happened to be attached to the same SAN that the server was. Uh, The client could... uh, client could be sent to another NFS server and could just do regular NFS reads and writes to that server. Uh, and there's also support for uh, object-based uh, protocol. And uh, the, the uh, benefit of that is that it gives you a way to offload the uh, I.O. bandwidth so that you can get higher aggregate bandwidth to the, uh, to the storage. Yeah, or the layout could specify you know, the, 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 the stride of the striping and uh, the location of the Stripe servers. It's actually a very generic and general uh, kind of protocol. It involved a small extension to NFS, just involving the ability to pass layouts back and forth between uh, the client and server. Uh, but uh, you know, we we try to use our imagination here at City and uh, think of you know like a associative uh, search of images and stuff like that. Uh, at, you know, using layouts for that kind of crazy stuff. Uh, but mostly um, uh, what we're interested in is, is uh, scalability and performance uh, using PNFS uh, to support uh, uh, high, you know, very high-speed access uh, to, uh, uh, to files striped across multiple servers. 
So what is City's involvement specifically? You mentioned that you were thinking of these like real world kind of cases of how PNFS would be used. What does City actually work on with NFS v4? Well, at the moment we have um, two or three major uh, uh, sponsored projects. Uh, we are part of a, uh, a, pro uh, a, a Department of Energy sponsored project out of the, the SIDAC program, the uh, scientific, I forget what SIDAC stands for. Um, the, stands for funding source. <laughs> yeah, well, they, they, <laughs> um, they, they, it comes out of the DOE Office of Science. Um, uh, the, uh, the Petascale Data Storage Institute is a group of five national labs and three universities that uh, is uh, trying to push forward uh, in, in this, the, the space in which, in which uh, DOE Office of Science does it work, which is, you know, a lot of accelerator work and, and uh, uh, simulations and, and uh, uh, you know, they're, they're mostly what, they, what, what that office supports in computing is, is uh, you know, computation-oriented uh, uh, projects. We're on the storage side. We're, like, uh, kind of unusual in, in that way. Anyway, so that, that's one of the uh, major projects. Uh, an uh, uh, another is uh, uh, sponsor, uh, sponsorship uh, from EMC to develop the, the, uh, the layout, the, the NFS, the PNFS client for, uh, for, for block layout, that is to say, uh, uh, the, you know, the NFS metadata server will give a layout that gives the uh, the, the LUN, you know, the uh, the LUN vector uh, uh, for a for a file um, or a file system, and then uh, uh, the, the client makes access uh, to the SAN uh, using iSCSI, but really kind of a local local disk kind of stuff uh, that parallel parallelizes pre pretty nicely. Um, and uh, the, the the third major project that we're working on is is a, a native Windows uh, uh, NFS v 4.1 client. Most of the work that's been done uh, to date in NFS v 4 has been uh, on Unix, uh, Linux, uh, you know, Unix-like systems. Uh, there is one NFS v 4 uh, project uh, from a company called Hummingbird, but. Uh, uh, Microsoft was interested in working with us to, to support PNFS uh, on, on the Windows client. And so we're doing something that's kind of unusual at City. We're hacking in the Windows kernel uh, to, uh, to develop a, a, a high performance, you know, that is to say, uh, you know, fast and slick uh, client implementation for NFS v4.1 uh, uh, right on top of Windows. So, you know, we do sponsored research. We're a university. Um, City's a little unusual in that uh, we have um, full-time staff working here. Uh, most uh, most university research labs are, you know, have, have grad students, and uh, you know, one 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 faculty uh, running a little empire of grad students. Here we have uh, me, one faculty running a little empire of, of full-time staff. You know, uh, Bruce is like the assistant director of City. We have a couple of uh, uh, folks uh, that. You know they uh, they're glued to their screen all day, and they're, they're programmers. They're excellent programmers. City really is like the technological jewel of uh, the University of Michigan, and has been for a long time. But we also have uh, graduate students uh, uh, doing doctoral research and support undergraduates uh, uh, with our with our research sponsorships, uh, kind of as you know internships and and to help develop their. Uh, their education and give them opportunities to work with uh, uh, with professionals on on research projects. Uh, but yeah, City's a you know it's a university research lab. No obvious bias in your in your uh, qualifications there that you gave it all either. I think. <laughs> well, you know we kind of do like working here. Uh, we get the <laughs> you know the psychic rewards of being academics. <laughs> that's. that's... <laughs> So let me ask you this. You, you mentioned a, a whole pile of uh, other organizations who are involved in NFSV4, mostly with whom you're, you're collaborating. Are there any other notable ones? Like you, you didn't actually mention Sun in there at all. I'm sorry. I meant Oracle. Um, <laughs> are, are they still involved in um, NFS development and or, you know, who owns – does anybody own the intellectual property or is this IETF owned or how does all that stuff kind of work? I'll, I'll, I'll answer the funding uh, question and I'll, I'll let Bruce talk about the IP stuff. Um, the early funding for cities NFS before development came primarily from
from Sun Microsystems and Network Appliance. I mean, Oracle and NetApp. Um, uh, their, uh, their support I mean, it was absolutely critical, and it was millions of dollars of support uh, because it was a really big job. Uh, their support tailed off over the years as we, uh, as the implementation became mature, and we started to kind of fill in the corners that that, that needed to be filled in. Things like the, uh, you know, like the Windows stuff and the the, uh, uh, the block based uh, PNFS client. Uh, so we're so we're working on uh, uh, in areas that are not central to the protocol. But uh, NetApp and Sun were absolutely instrumental in the uh, early days. IBM also provided uh, uh, a, a great deal of support, uh, you know, sponsored uh, research support uh, in our, our work in developing the, the, the cluster, the support for cluster file systems. Um, NetApp continues to support City, and uh, I'm imagining that uh, there will be other, other folks uh, that, that provide financial support. We, we, we got support from PolyServe. Uh, anyone else? Uh, I don't know, a whole bunch of, you know, it, what's, what's cool about it is, is, is that there are a lot of vendors involved in the development of, of, of V4, both in the specification, but also in their, in their own implementations that they hope to make a lot of money, uh, uh, you know, selling products. Um, City has been kind of this neutral meeting ground uh, for for the vendors, where they can you know they can all come and work with us, and know that that uh, you know we don't have a bias in favor or against uh, uh, any one of them, uh, and um, you know it's a, we we are city's a vendor neutral place uh, that supports this kind of multi vendor activity, which is important because you know what we're trying to provide is interoperability for a protocol so that the vendors can all go out and make the best possible implementation and make the most possible money off of it. So now let me ask Bruce to talk about the IP stuff. IP stuff. The intellectual okay. property. So the protocols are... <laughs> no, yeah. the, the protocols are all you know, entirely neutral. They're all controlled by the IETF. Um, the uh, work that we do is, is released under... A, sort of BSD-like uh, open source license that's very liberal. Um, in practice, the work that's incorporated into the Linux kernel by necessity ends up being uh, GPL, more or less. Uh, so everything that City does is, is open source. Uh, the other implementations, of course, aren't all, although uh, Solaris is at least should mostly be. I don't know, does that answer the question? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Would you say that any one of these, like, is is the work that you do that ends up going into Linux? Would you consider that, say, uh, you know, a reference implementation? Like, do other people derive, you know, vendors derive from that, or do they write their own either from scratch or at least parts of it from scratch? Or, you know, how do how do they typically do that? Right. Uh, I expect that they write their code from scratch, but we are a reference implementation in the in the sense that uh, we provide an exam example of an implementation of the protocol. And uh, we're often one of the the first uh, testing targets, or the first testing target. Uh, and okay. we also provide some other uh, testing tools. We have a you know complete set of regression tests in PyInfest that's widely used by server. Yeah, we example. we wrote a, a complete implementation of NFS v4 in uh, Python, uh, which <laughs> oh wow. It, yeah, and and it's 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 fabulous for for testing because you can build scripts. That uh, do the sort of thing that you know it would be difficult to to make exactly the you know some some specific behavior occur uh, in a file system by manipulating the file system externally, but uh, because we have all of the components of, of uh, NFS v4 uh, in uh, written in Python, you you can build these bizarro scripts that that test wild error conditions or uh, uh, performance, uh, performance kinds of things. Interoperability is, is, you know, is key when you're developing a protocol like this. So yeah, we have, we, the intent all along was for our, our, our work to be a reference implementation that vendors would use to look over our shoulder, uh, but also for testing correctness of their own implementation. Uh, in this, to the extent that they interoperate with us, 
then their implementation is correct. Uh, that's kind of arrogant, really. If if there if the interoperability uh, if interoperability fails, then you know we both sit down and go over the spec line by line and go over our code line by line and figure out you know who's who is broken. Uh, sure, but, it's kind of the transitivity of of uh, interoperability, right? Yeah, yeah. But we have like three. We we we've been having three meetings per year for years now, for over five years. Bakeathons. Uh, and and uh, the annual Connectathon, which are interoperability bake off kinds of uh, 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 testing uh, uh, environments. In fact, we're, we're, we have one coming up in a few weeks, right? First week in October, we'll all be in Austin. Uh, you know, a bunch of uh, geeks sitting there with their computers, pointing them at each other and uh, looking for problems. Yeah, it's really pretty funny. It's a long table with a lot of geeks. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. So, so what's the what's kind of the uptake of of NFS v four? I mean, what's what's the status? Are vendors shipping products? You know, can I go out and get an NFS v four clients and servers and put them on my cluster today? Or, you know, where where are we in the adoption process? Yeah, I'm guessing that uh, whatever it is that you're running has v four today. Uh, but what do you have? Uh, I've got Red Hat version four, so probably oh, not. Oh. <laughs> okay, but not that. <laughs> yeah, modern versions of uh, like, yes, so. modern be the keyword there. Someday I'll get around to updating to Red Hat five, but uh, I'm I'm several thousand miles away from my cluster, so I don't have an easy luxury to do that. Yeah, uh, V four first appeared in two dot six, uh, and. Uh, it has matured with the with the numerous releases of uh, uh, of 2.6 and um, with bug fixes and uh, performance enhancements. But uh, anyone running Linux, anyone running a you know recent version of Linux, has v4. Now whether they're using v4 is another question because uh, the client and server negotiate which version they're going of, of NFS they're going to use v2, v3, v4. Um, and uh, I'm not I'm not sure that uh, uh, a lot of people are using V4 at this point. Uh, I know that you know a lot of Sun customers are using it, but um, you know honestly the you know the the driving force for V4 in the early days was expected to be uh, security and and long haul performance. But those turn out not to be huge market drivers. Um, you know, as usual, nobody wants to pay for security. So nobody, and even though they have V4, they don't want to pay for the administrative overhead of having to learn, you know, how to set up your mounts and your exports for V4. Everything seems to be working okay for V3, so let's just stick with that. And uh, the long haul stuff uh, uh, turns out not to have... Uh, been you know a big enough market to to to, to really drive uh, uh, a, a cut over. We're thinking that PNFS in 4.1 will be uh, the thing that pushes uh, HPC and some other enterprise scale uh, folks, uh, you know the petrochemical industry, the financial industries, uh, into demanding the features that that uh, that that 4.1 offers. Uh, features offer. Um, so, you know, I guess we're kind of looking at uh, uh, the, the market, the V4 market really exploding like in 2011 time frame. You know, at the moment, 4.1 is still being, you know, the, the, the protocol is, is spec'd out. The RFC will be out any day. It was approved by the uh, 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 Internet uh, uh, Activities Board. I don't know, the, one of the one of these, you know, IETF uh, guru kind of things. Uh, they uh, approved the the final specification of it last December. It's been in the hands of the RFC editors uh, to dot all the I's and to get all the witches and that's right. Uh, so we're awaiting the actual release of the RFC. But the 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 spec that was approved is the specification of the protocol. Um, and we're spending the the current candle calendar year uh, completing. All of the implementations, which, uh, they really are pretty much complete. But then we have to, you know, there's this process of getting things into the Linux kernel, 
that involves um, a consent, consensus management among developers and maintainers. Now, Bruce is one of the co-maintainers of the uh, NFS server. Uh, the, the client maintainer also lives in Ann Arbor, and we work very closely with him, Tron Mikkelbust. Um, but those guys are, you know, you know, it's funny. I mean, Bruce is sitting right next to me, and, you know, I, I, I pay his salary, but in a way, he works for Linus, you know. Uh, he is addressing some concerns that, um, you know, that the, that the folks that are sponsoring the research here, the R&D here, uh, they're not as all that interested in getting everything right. They really want to get things done. Uh, whereas Bruce has a vested interest in getting things right. I, I should stop speaking for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a process, and there's been a long prototyping process going on in 4.1, and uh, people have demonstrated that the 4.1 can be made to work between you know two independently implemented uh, clients and servers at this point, and uh, have demonstrated that they can get uh, some of the performance characteristics out of it that are driving it. But uh, there's some work that needs to be done to go from those prototypes to something that uh, handles all the kernel, the, all the uh, sort of corner cases, and that won't eat your data when something goes a little bit wrong, and that uh, has code that's just uh, easy to understand and that can be maintained in the future by the uh, kernel community. And yeah, maintainers care about maintenance. I don't know what the deal is with that. So there's a process of, of negotiation there, and you know the uh, uh, people who are working on the prototype trying to try and make it uh, you know more correct and uh, cleaner, and uh, then uh, submitting it to to the kernel maintainers and, uh, and it's a the huge, rest of the kernel community. And it's a big change. So that shoveling that much change into the kernel, uh, it has to be refactored in ways that uh, it can be you know, understood and digested by the developers that have a stake in, in all of this. Uh, and at some point, consensus happens, and the maintainers uh, allow things to, you know, to slip through the sieve. So our, our hope is that, and here I'm speaking for me, not for Bruce, is that we can get uh, PNFS into the Linux kernel in the current calendar year, and then uh, spend 2010 uh, soaking it and uh, working on performance issues and doing instrumentation and scalability testing so that uh, by the end of 2010, it really is ready for, for enterprise. So the enterprise on the, uh, of the, of the you know, uh, RHEL uh, uh, kind, of, kind of customer. We expect that there will be early adopters in the HPC community, especially at the, at the national labs, that start using PNFS. Uh, that are, well, they're using PNFS now in some instances. But uh, you know, for those guys, it's really important that the, the kernel that they get from kernel.org have everything they, they need and they, they not do special kinds of patching uh, to build the kernels that, uh, that, they, that they need. So... You know, so that's the you know that's the kind of the the, the roadmap uh, that that we're, that we're looking at, and and some of the you know some of the constraints and the, and the difficulties uh, in the the, sort of the social process of developing uh, software in this multi vendor kind of uh, environment. Okay, guys. So, is there like the tools for anything like PNFS if someone did want to try it, and things that are not shipped with the Linux kernel right now, like an NFS v4 website, anything like that, where are those located? Okay, yeah. We do have software repositories with the, our experimental code. We have a mailing list, which people are welcome to ask questions on. And uh, the best thing to do will just be to Google for PNFS and Linux. And that will ultimately get you to a Git tree and... Uh... And you just, you know, kind of whatever it is that you do to a Git tree, uh, get it. you get it. <laughs> and then you, you know, and you build it. Uh, and, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it is ready uh, and waiting for, uh, for, for, for people interested in, in, uh, uh, in using it in, in, in test kind of scenarios. In fact, Brock and I were talking this morning about, you know, what could we do between City and, 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 and his lab 
to you know maybe play around with with uh, uh, some of the you know scalability uh, characteristics uh, 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 in, that are that are developing in storage uh, protocols uh, as an adjunct to the kind of stuff that they do you know kind of uh, on a day by day basis. So that's that's kind of where it's at now. Is is interested uh, people you know geeks with with some time on their hands and and kind of you know a little bit of craziness. Are, are playing around with it and and, and benefiting from it, um, but uh, it, it won't be until it's you know integrated in, into the kernel.org kernel into the mainline kernel uh, that uh, you know ordinary people, ordinary geeks, <laughs> will will start getting their hands on it. But uh, early early adopters now uh, uh, are, are are welcome and and, and a, a bunch of people are playing with it. Uh, at, at, you know, right at right at this moment. Okay, thanks a lot, Peter and Bruce, for your time talking about NFS v4, um, the 4.1 standard. is hopefully something we see soon. Um, and you can get this show at www.rce-cast.com. There's an RSS feed and iTunes link, or you can always just download the MP3s. They're released every other week. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys. Thank you.